Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, this uh, conversation organized by the Norwegian chapter of the Internet Society. Uh, I'm the former uh, chairman person of uh, ISOC Norway. Um, uh, we have several ISOC people here, but uh, Today's um, conversation isn't a typical Internet Society topic. It's more uh, around legislations, which, which, which we do care a lot about, but also open source. And uh, today we have uh, a nice panel here, uh, myself included, of course. I consider myself nice, too. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, 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 let's start with a quick introduction about uh, like uh, of who we are, and then we'll go into what the topic of the today's conversation is. So, if we start at the end here with Kasper. Yeah, I am Kasper Rosa Ludvigsen. I am a Danish lawyer. I'm doing a PhD in cybersecurity and law, and I also already had have had a postdoc for another year, but we're nearing a year at the University of Newcastle. And I, as I said, do research in cybersecurity and law. In the context of this panel, I am here to represent the law and the security side, coincidentally. And I also really love EU law, so it's great to have me here when we're literally talking about that quite a lot today. Yep. And you've been a practitioner of EU that law. That is true, that is true. I also used to be a civil servant uh, in something called Angus Jules in Denmark, which is where all appeal decisions, or most appeal administrative law appeal decisions go to. So I pretended to be an administrative judge for a while there, which was fun too. Uh, hi, I'm Simon Phipps. Um, I am a stateless European, uh, currently clinging to the United Kingdom, but with my citizenship removed by my government. Um, so I have been working in the field of open source for a long time uh, for lots of big international companies. Uh, I stopped being a slave of international corporations in 2010 and became the president of the Open Source Initiative. I've been working at Open Source Initiative as a volunteer for a decade, and then uh, two years ago joined the, uh, became a paid member of staff. And my focus area at the, the Open Source Initiative is uh, European policy and how it affects open source. And at the moment, I'm uh, focused particularly on a tidal wave of legislation that's coming out of Brussels in connection with the digital agenda, uh, uh, all written by people who love open source but unfortunately don't understand it well enough uh, to not accidentally kill it as they love it. Um, yeah. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Hans-Petter Fjell. Uh, I work as a senior security analyst at a company called Defendable. I'm uh, responsible for uh, advising the uh, head of security in corporations, and uh, I'm the go-to guy if uh, everything fails and there's uh, an emergency, then I get called out, and I'm in the front line of that. So I'm the I'm the info security uh, uh, motive in this. Alibi. Uh, alibi. Uh, and only, alibi thank only here until uh, your pager goes off. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry about that. Uh, um, I also have a record of uh, initiatives with uh, free and open software. I was the head of the Norwegian Unix user group for many years, and I'm still engaged with that. Uh, so I, that's not a field that's unfamiliar to me. And quickly about myself, um, I'll take off my Internet Society hat and put on uh, my open source hat. Um, I've been part of um, an, an, a meetup community in Oslo in Norway around the Perl and CPAN uh, open source ecosystems um, uh, organized meetups and hackathons and conferences and I'm also uh, here as a person who channels the thoughts and will of the Perl toolchain community which is a group of people who uh, uh, work on the common infrastructure for uh, one of those uh, larger open source communities out there and who very much care about uh, uh, supply chain security, how uh, the software people are using uh, is actually um, uh, distributed and uh, issues around um, authenticity and all, uh, who gets to uh, publish things and uh, all those juicy topics that are relevant for for this uh, community here. And I might also mention, uh, 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 just quickly, that both Hans Petter and myself, we've been involved in a hackerspace here in Oslo called Hackeriet, which is a gathering of um, 
software interested and security interested uh, people who want to have a place where we can hang out and uh, do projects and talk about anything related computers and policy and uh, uh, geeking out on stuff so so this tonight's topic has actually been a recurring topic at that place also so that's one of the reasons we have perhaps a few of uh, these guys here in the uh, in audience and thank you for showing so, um, EU is doing stuff. We're not in the EU right now. We are in the European economic area. So we're standing in Norway outside and looking what our neighbors are doing and say, oh sh saying, oh shit, what's, what's going to happen? Um, so in a sense, it's kind of weird to talk about EU laws outside of the EU, but in a sense, uh, uh, these laws will be affecting lots of people outside of the EU in, in general. And anybody who wants to do business with the EU, even if it's uh, far away on the other side of the planet, they will have to kind of care a little bit about this. So um, uh, just to build up some context, I would like you to maybe, Casper, um, uh, if you if you will, um, quickly give us a uh, as a short introduction on which laws that are going to have the most impact when it comes to <laughs> open source and security. Yeah, so, so but be because uh, this relates to the security part, the European Union has, after, let's say, because you can take this in two ways, you can say, are we starting from when the EU made new types of prior legislation? Because even back then, I would argue, the security became a, an angle that they focused more on, or we can do a post-GDPR world, which is probably also very adequate here, as most people have a relationship, familiarity, and maybe hatred towards GDPR, all of, of which are fair. Uh, it was not was not the perfect uh, regulation in any way. N none of us that read it very early on and followed all the way and saw its implementation and years after keep seeing its implementation think so. But the security, so, so what, what, what is going to, what, what we're going to talk about today amounts, amounts to, let's say, let's focus primarily on four pieces of legislation. So we have the Cyber Resilience Act, which is kind of the primary piece of legislation which we'll discuss today. And then we have the NIST 2 directive, which is the follow-up to the first NIST directive, which is essentially the, 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 the infrastructure security directive. And it's mostly cybersecurity, but you, its wording does actually expand a bit into physical cybersecurity, you know, making sure that you can't access, actually access stuff. Um, let me make a quick anecdote for infrastructure there. Uh, the first, the NIST directive, the first one was implemented in different ways in each country. But the example I bring up to computer scientists when explaining this is electricians. How did we do that in Denmark? How did we make cyber security better for electricians? And that sounds really weird, but they maintain infrastructure and they maintain critical infrastructure. So there's a whole set of administrative rules just about what kind of security should they have and what are the, the incident response types they need to do, both in physical and normal cyber security. So, but that would be NIST two, sort of the second uh, directive there. We also want to talk a bit about the Digital Markets Act, because that, uh, you know, it's, it's, a no, it's like the, these big platforms may or may not rely on uh, free open source software, but as uh, we will get to later, it maybe is a bit more complicated than that. But that's also uh, an act that, that that everyone will feel something from, because we use Twitter, or Facebook, or something like that, and all these companies will be affected by the Digital Markets Act, and then. Maybe we'll talk about uh, some other cyber initiatives, but let's maybe take those three primarily first, and perhaps also the product liability well, directive, the new one that's coming up. The problem with discussing that becomes it we don't know how it's going to end up, but yes. you know. They're, and they're not returning my emails. Right, they don't. <laughs> no, no, no. So no. there's, so there's, I mean, there's a couple, there's more. Yeah, you way know, more. Just to let you know, it, I, I work for OSI uh, a third of my time, and there's, there is the CRA, there's NIST 2, there's the Digital Markets Act. There is the Digital Services Act, which is applicable. There is the Product Liability Directive revision, which is in play, which makes all of the things in all of these bills give companies liability when they fail to do things about them. There is the uh, the, the upcoming Standard Essential Patent Directive uh, uh, regulation. Um, there is the uh, the uh, Interoperable Europe Act. Um, there is a uh, a study on the on Europe's digital infrastructure, which is in progress. Um, there's like nine things that you know. It was Christmas, and, and we we all got up and looked in our email, and there's about nine things that are all coming the next day. So there's there's a whole lot of things in play at the moment, uh, and um, they're not all completely terrible. Uh, I mean, the CRA does a thing that's really useful. 
which is make, create a, a statutory requirement to provide consumers with a secure computing environment. And, and that's a very useful and valid thing. The problem is that, uh, as they say, when you open a door, anything can go through. And um, there are many doors open at the moment, and there are many better resourced companies than ISOC, OSI, and re university researchers. And there are, there's the potential that some very bad things will happen. And then, in addition, the people who've drafted the legislation haven't necessarily understood what they were writing about. And they have done one or two things that many of us in the open source community think are inadvisable. Um, but the best way to sum up the CRA, I think, is to say that what it does, it, it extends the European CE mark to software. So once the CRA goes on the books, you'll begin to see software that's got a CE mark. Um, if it has the CE mark, that means that the company that supplied the software to you uh, claims that they comply with all of the relevant terms in the CRA. Yeah, and, Good. and very quickly, the CE mark yeah. is something you can look at uh, electronic devices to say that they follow certain yes. safety yeah. uh, demands. For well, it's it's the Euro it's yeah. the the um, the harmonised way for Europe for Europe to allow manufacturers to indicate they're complying with EU law. Right. So you see it on everything. You see it on children's toys. You see it on cars. You see it on refrigerators. And now you're going to start seeing it on software as well. And this is where the part I mentioned, the new progs initiatives, comes in because that is. That was when the modern version of the CE mark appeared and started to be used on all the new types, uh, all the types of products they made new legislation for. Uh, so that's the connection I really wanted to make there. But you're right that that's the the massive part that you have this process which was otherwise like so that that whole products initiative is interesting because they standardize they think themselves at least they standardize the way you uh, you control for example the CE mark. When should we you know do sweeps? When shouldn't we do sweeps? A lot of legislation mimics this. Uh, structure and that's why knowing past product legislation tells you a lot about the Cyber Resilience Act, which is dumb because they were core regulations. A lot of them. Why did they start using acts? There's no answer. Like the act regulation is one to one the same in the EU right now. It's just a wording. So you you, well, I mean, you should call it the act, Cyber Resilience Act, but in reality it is just a regulation. Uh, it's just because it sounds yeah. fancier, perhaps. Well, I mean that needs clarifying for people as well who aren't who, who don't oh, yeah. play, don't Sorry. play games here. So yeah. so so, so the, the European. Uh, union does two things to all the member states. One of the things it does is it, it issues directives. And a directive tells every country in the European Union, you've got to now make some laws that do the thing that's in this directive. And so it, the directive gets transposed into national law over a period of two or maybe even three years yeah. from the date that the European Parliament approves it. And then there are regulations or acts, and those are union-wide laws that become applicable Im immediately when the European Parliament passes them. So the Cyber Resilience Act is going to be passed in the third quarter this year, and it will immediately become effective, and it, its, uh, uh, its rules will then affect software manufacturers within one to two years from the date that it becomes effective. We've got loads of questions there, yeah. Salva. Are you I, um, Salva, yeah. um, just for the order, do you want to have questions while you're talking, or do you want to have some sort of a bash? Let, let's do questions? quickly just to establish some basic uh, information here uh, on what this uh, is and uh, what it, who it applies to, which was my next question. And then we can have a few questions uh, yeah. uh, now and then. Because we, we, we at the, on the panel here also have some questions. So uh, <laughs> take it easy. We have almost uh, two hours in total for this whole thing here, so no stress. Yeah. But uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that timeline? So That's the amazing. Cyber Resilience Act is being pressed very fast. It's using a new structure for European legislation. The, the uh, Previously, all European legislation used terminology from something called the Blue Guide. And there was a lot of thinking you had to do in writing new legislation, because you had to work out how your new terminology complemented what was in the Blue Guide. But there's now a new frame, harmonized framework for legislation that has been devised. And this is one of the first acts that uses that harmonized framework. And consequently, the timeline from the European Commission issuing draft text, which happened at the beginning of this year, to it becoming a law, which is going to happen maybe by September this year, wow. is, a, is in, a, a hugely accelerated timeline to what we're used to, where we, we're used to the European Commission writing text, and it taking maybe two years to reach the stage where the Parliament is ready to vote on it. 
because everybody has decided to restrict themselves to only using the terminology in the new framework. And, and because of that, because it's using the new legislative framework, it's greatly accelerated. And then in addition to that, the Swedish presidency is very keen to get this onto the books before they hand the keys of the kingdom over to the, the uh, next rulers of the uh, European Council. And so that, that is also a reason why it's on an accelerated timeline. And then when you look at the CRA, it, its provisions say that it becomes effective. I think it's between, there's some things that are one year after, yeah. after ratification, and there's some things that are two years after. Yeah, this is very standard procedure for product legislation that they will often, especially in the end, have provisions that say, oh, oh this part in goes into effect here and this goes into effect here. This is, this is standard. For, for the Cyber Resilience Act, we should maybe have seen a longer transitionary period, uh, honestly, because some of the things you're doing are yeah, massive, even yeah. though we'll talk about that in a moment, even though um, the way the preambles, so in EU law, you have preambles, you have articles, you have annexes. Those are the three parts you have in directives or in regulations or acts. And then you might also want to include parliamentary debates or council debates for an impact studies and all the other sources to understand what are you even reading here. But the main text should be the articles, then the preambles, those, those, and then annexes, but depending on the text. Yeah. But you really want to focus on that. So we'll talk a little bit about those because they, they start showing, you know, they will answer some of your questions. <coughs> and then they won't at the same time. <laughs> um, we could, but what I wanted to mention was it, it's not unusual now for the EU, or rather they're able to, like postponement is possible is what I wanted to point out here. So I work with medical devices, that's one of my specialization areas, also regarding security, because in that situation, security is safety, because if medical device fails, you could get injured. You know, you can't get injured necessarily with other things fail because of adversarial attacks from, yeah, adversaries, from whoever. Um, but the medical device regulation was supposed to have entered into force, the new one, in 2020. Yeah, <laughs> we had COVID, so it, it, we still, some things now are exempted that haven't been yeah, done yet, so we, we know, three, we're three years past when it was supposed to enter into force. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that there are possibilities, even, even if it seems rigid, I'm pretty sure we might see ways in which some of these parts could be delayed if, if necessary. And that would be something we, we perhaps say in the panel for some of the things we'll talk about. We've already said now, but even later, might, yeah. we might be interested in, in a postponement to, to protect those, some aspects there. I'm less, in, I'm less uh, optimistic than that. <laughs> uh, I believe that this act is being viewed by parliamentarians as a uh, protecting the children class act. Oh. And consequently, it is going to be passed uh, okay. with the greatest speed. So let, let's just no. assume we have to hurry. Yeah, so I think I do think we have to hurry with we, we that if we want to make changes, the amendment deadline is April twenty seventh mm. in, oh, that's in next Parliament, week. which is next week. Um, the the debates will be in May, um, and uh, uh, there we do have some some elasticity in helping uh, parliamentarians understand the consequences of what's going on. Yeah. But we don't think we can change any of the structure anymore. We think that it's that the structure of the CRA is pretty much fixed now. Okay. Do you have something important? Because I yes, would like to quite, move on. Quite. Yeah. He mentioned protecting the children. There is actually a separate act that's worth reading if you want to. Yeah, that's security. another one. Child <laughs> sexual abuse, I think, act as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. the, the uh, yeah. That, that's a little bit beyond yeah. the chat, topic of this uh, chat, chat control. Yeah, chat control. That, that that is a kind of worms with. which but, but it's worth its own meeting. Mm. But the, we've we've been advised by parliamentarians that most MEPs consider this to be a a a, a primary consumer protection act. Right. And they do not believe it should be delayed for any reason. Yeah, could we? Could you guys very quickly give us a, a rough picture of who these laws apply to? Okay. So, um, so th th originally, we understand that originally the CRA was intended to apply only to the manufacturers of devices that had software in them. So things like modems, medical appliances, telephones, the, the, all the all the mobile phone people managed to get themselves exempted from it. So their, their, their mobile devices are largely exempt. Um, and then there was a, an impact assessment conducted. And the impact assessment said uh, that there was no impact from extending the, the, the act to cover all software, not just software that's <laughs> embedded in devices. And they based that on reading a, uh, a German academic study that said that described software um, as, uh, that, that made a distinction about open source software between commercial and and community open source, and they misunderstood the academic and used his research as the basis for a decision to apply it to everything. So this act applies to all software, so it describes 
uh, applicability is to products with digital elements. And those products with digital elements yeah. no longer need to have a physical component. That's <laughs> so, so any product, wants to any, <laughs> any product with a digital element without a physical component is included as well as products with a digital element that include a physical component. And it needs to have logical or physical network access. That's yes. the other part. That's the other. You can, and also, you mentioned medical devices. No, medical devices are exempted because yeah, you have right. medical device legislation. Cars are exempted because the certification process is a bit different because it includes safety yeah. aspects. Yeah. And you have more exemptions than that, but basically, yeah. It, the coverage there, yeah, is quite wide. I may have actually contributed to them wanting non-embedded and embedded software and hardware because we argued from a safety and security perspective that it's <laughs> necessary to include them. We didn't say that it's easy. No, <laughs> we said we said it was necessary for. But, but this other is uh, this is for the CRA mostly. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and then we have the NIST two directive, which yes. kind of does, tries to achieve the same thing, but mm. for critical infrastructure. Yeah. So NIST two directive is a directive, which means implementation. But the interesting part is that. Very much like the GDPR, except we didn't go to regulation. We have a lot past experience. NIST 1 existed. It failed, some argue. Um, but we have experience on a national basis of the implementation, what we should do. And NIST increases the requirements and includes open source. So surprisingly, to, uh, this is why I control F when you read a PDF is the best friend ever. Like I read the whole thing, of course. But if I need to remind myself, oh, yeah, open source is mentioned in an article. Because every member state. Uh, you know, by 2025, which is more most of these things must be implemented ideally, but this is the EU. We're used to a lot of countries being like, oh, I can't implement it very well. Oh, I'll take a couple years extra. And then they get fined at the European court and commission is mad at them. But, you know, so 25, but ideally, well, probably later. That's how we usually know it. But it basically forces member states to make good legislation about when and when shouldn't you use open source software or free open source software in your critical infrastructure. And it does not really, it, it maybe expands the what is a critical infrastructure and what is a critical entity a little bit, but it's very, very, as in most of the, the academic writings or even thoughts about NIS 1 will apply to NIS 2 as well and still in, in the annex part. I've read that there's a whole lot of new sectors that are touched by NIS 2. Basically, so the, this is again the EU. Countries like Denmark already included these in critical infrastructure. Oh, okay. So the commission, like they usually do, not just Denmark, also the Netherlands, but they go, oh, not a country has a good way to do this. Let's use this in an updated legislation. Right. Yeah. So it's different from country to country. But OK, uh, do you, you yeah. have a question? The, the CRA, the, it has an exemption for free and open software that is not uh, commercially driven. So this is this is a so this is actually a question where we don't even have academic papers that can answer this fully yet. Um, basically, uh, it comes down to how you read the definition of products. It comes down to how you read the definition of manufacturers, and this is, comes back to what Simon already mentioned. But depending on how it's understood in in you know in pr in actual enforcement, so we can sit here and talk about how we is this you know this is the typical risk versus what happens in practice afterwards. Like there might be yeah. a lot of risk. There might be you know EU could ruin things. They also might not. Uh, it's it's difficult because we're working with people and giant infrastructures with lots of people speaking of law that wants to do law on top of also doing technical stuff at the same time. So so the answer to that would be. Um, it relies on yet a commercial part, and the commercial part is just complicated with free open source software because often you will you will have projects that to people that aren't part of the project don't use it, don't understand it, look commercial but free and open source, of course. Yeah. But to those that work on it, volunteer basis perhaps or passion, okay. won't be commercial but, to them. Yeah, and 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 they define that if you do training or support, that's commercial. So right. then it's not. Yeah, accepted. you're providing it. Yes. So so that, that this whole topic is is one of the great areas of mm. complexity because. Um, th this this text was drafted after the um, after the impact assessment said to expand to all products with digital elements, and uh, and the impact assessment made the incorrect assessment of, of Doug Reel's research, and incorrectly decided that you could differentiate between community open source and commercial open source, not realizing that all open source software is commercial in the sense that it can be used in commerce. Uh, which is what matters. And um, while the blue guide gives some useful language that might provide guidance, many, many communities have read this text in Recital 10, and they say, well, ha well hold on a minute. Um, you know, Eclipse Foundation, well, we, we have a regular release cycle, and that means we qualify because we are regularly releasing software. And and then uh, ICE, um, uh, uh, not ISOC, um, uh, NLNet Labs, mm. who produce all the infrastructure for the internet, 
uh, along with uh, a, a US counterpart, they read it and they said, well, hold on a minute, many companies fund NLNet Labs with donations on the basis that they're then going to receive all the software that runs DNS. Well, and surely we, we count as, quite, as, as uh, commercial as well. And so as many groups have looked at it, they've felt that the language in Recital 10 is insufficiently uh, articulated to actually help organizations know f with certainty that they don't count as being commercial. And consequently, there are endless amendments around Recital I've got one of them here. Uh, there's endless attempts to modify Recital 10 so that it is clear about stating uh, that it, the commercial intent doesn't matter. But the whole error of, the, of Recital 10 is believing that you can distinguish on the basis of intent with the software anyway, because the, the whole point of open source software is there is no connection between the motives of the person writing the software and the mo motives of the person deploying the software. And consequently, there's no such thing as commercial software. And at the same time, all software is commercial. <laughs> and so once I, ex I explained this to Benjamin, who wrote the CRA, and he was a little bit flummoxed by it. He yeah. hadn't really expected that to be this, the case. Uh, very quickly, if you can keep it short. So yeah, so the enforcement structure an, I, I don't disagree with recital 10 being kind of crap, but that's typical with recitals or preambles. Both words are correct here. Uh, they won't, like the, the people that actually enforce won't read the recitals necessarily. They will read primarily the articles, and in the articles, <coughs> you can definitely interpret ways out of this. But my issue then becomes, will the uh, market surveillance bodies, aka the authorities, actually enforcing? Will will they? What, what will they do in the first place regarding open source software? That I could also, I, I kind of yeah. like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of confused about essentially. Well, and then there's, 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 there's problems further down the text yeah. as well, like in Article 16. Uh, let, I want to see if I can understand some of the picture here uh, and summarize it. Um, EU wants uh, increased security and awareness and processes uh, throughout the societies in, in Europe. Uh, so they f find different parts of. Uh, businesses and sectors where they can make a big difference by asking people to, or businesses to follow a bunch of new laws. It uh, applies to software that they have, and then I'm thinking, all right, um, most of the software out there today runs on open source, and I've seen numbers ranging from 60 to 98 mm. percent. Uh, like if some business has uh, a, a service they're making for the local waterworks or they uh, write some software for deploying uh, updates to switches or routers, uh, they use open source software as part of the stack, almost guaranteed. Uh, um, uh, and that means uh, if they have to have a security regime in place, they will have to include that open source software into the re security regime, like uh, uh, figuring out what you're running, making sure it's easy and, uh, and up to date. And if the, an incident happens or some zero day uh, suddenly appears uh, out of Norway, <coughs> no way. <laughs> Out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't Norway is big on zero days. <laughs> uh, as far as I, uh, I thought it was all coming from Russia as well. <laughs> no comment. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, then you have to be able to respond accordingly. Yeah. And and but it, for me, the voices of the people that actually write the software, the the, the developers who wrote something useful for themselves on their in the free time. Uh, just for fun even, or just to try out some new language or experiment a little bit with the like, technology or, or uh, and, and someone else picked it up and said, yes, this is useful and it has an open source license on it, so I will be using it. And suddenly it becomes part of critical infrastructure. And, yeah. and it doesn't have to have happened just recently, it might have happened 10 or 15 years ago. Someone wrote something useful for fun, and it turned out to be so useful that it uh, is part of the something that updates uh, 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 a website that is being used by public, public administration yeah. for something important, for example. In indeed. And um, uh, then there's a question like, okay, what, what happens here? Like, is, 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 if, if the uh, spect like the, the spectrum from uh, people who and um, business and organizations who keep track of and make sure those, those critical infrastructures on those devices work as expected 
all the way to the volunteers that they base upon. There's like a, a point at which uh, liability stops, and that's the current discussion. Like, uh, should uh, open source businesses be liable? Should the developers be liable? Should only regular businesses that don't have? That's one part. But even then, those people where where the line is drawn. Right. That those people at inside of the line of liability, they will look around the, towards those who are not liable, but we still need these guys, and they need to be uh, responsive and uh, help us make sure that they're part of whatever regime those who are liable have to follow. So, so even if we find a, a sensible place where liability stops, the rest will be affected. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, I think this is a good thing. Uh, because I think that finally companies who have been strip mining open source for years and contributing nothing to the developers and the communities working with the software are suddenly going to be faced with a, a, a huge liability because the PLD is going to create this massive liability for, for manufacturers of products with digital elements. And they're going to have to come to all of these communities and say, please, will you help us to comply with the, the, uh, the uh, Cyber Resilience Act? Because we don't want to become liable for 10% of our annual global but, turnover. But then you have some guy uh, sitting uh, in a mom's basement somewhere in uh, California uh, yeah. saying, what? Yeah, well, it, Me? Hey, I don't live in the EU. Yeah. Why should I care? Yes, well, the, and, and, the, and he's the one who's going to be, have to be given the money to care. And I, I quite like that. I quite like the idea that, uh, you know, naming no corporations in particular, some corporations are going to have to go to that guy in, in an okay, so and, so and hire him. Yeah. It's very okay, very quickly. So this is where uh, I also write and focus on supply chain security, because this is where the CR is interesting too. You, you I, I, so I was supposed to have worked with Google and, 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 and uh, GitHub this year on this specific matter, but because I'm changing jobs, uh, I have to <laughs> make a new grant proposal for that exact project. But basically, they're very interested in automating these issues before the CRA even comes into effect, or at least help uh, corporations automate it and figure out what parts are vulnerable and which parts we didn't, for example, have to uh, fulfill requirements for in a, in a Cyber Resilience Act way. Um, but but no, like I, I agree with Simon that it's nice to see this, but I also, Salve, you, you and I talked about this before, but there's obviously a risk of not just harassment, but oh, yeah. component, when you're component, so in, in the CRA, this is about components. If, if you, because the CRA is about the manufacturer. This is product uh, legislation, as I said in the start. So manufacturer, 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 importer, distributor, and all the other words they use, but manufacturer is the core one here. The obligation for manufacturers, this is article 10 usually, it is also this one. Um, that one focuses on, on the component part and on the responsibility for maintaining and understanding the components is on the manufacturer. This mirrors what we saw in, when the medical device regulation came into effect where in that community, um, yeah, you take it up very, 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 very seriously, but coincidentally, you still use open so for free and open source solutions sometimes, but then we expect the notified bodies to provide the correct testing to make sure that maybe they make their own version for that specific product that then lasts for five years before they make the updated version or whatever happens. Unlike the CRA, which focuses on yeah five-year year life cycle minimally, ish. Uh, the medical device industry does less. It's two or three years, but you know we wish it was five years. <laughs> Would be nice. Yeah. But yeah, that's but basically. To, you know, to round this up, the, the there's going to be a very good effect from the CRA, which is that corporations will have to begin to take responsibility for the security of the software that they have basically been. Uh, it, the word steal isn't the right word to use because it's been offered willingly. But they've been taking software from people, uh, placing, I'm happy, I'm placing an expectation on them and, and then, then being offended when they don't meet it. And this is going to put teeth behind yeah. the requirement that they go down the supply chain and that they actually have a, a professional relationship with people in their supply chain. On, at the same time, the problem is that it isn't clear where the dividing line for who is actually responsible is. Yeah. And if we don't get that clarified, we may well discover that people, manufacturers of, uh, the guy in the, in the basement in Nebraska may decide to put a, a, a geo block on his Git uh, repository to make sure that people in Europe can't get his code so he doesn't accidentally become liable. So that means um, we'll still have to find ways to keep a certain level of goodwill uh, alive 
and not make this into a war between people who make the code and those who use it. And say, I'm, I'm a f I sometimes use the term freeloader uh, to, um, when to talking about co companies who just use open source and never do any uh, interaction with the community or give anything back or, or sponsor or anything. Uh, and of that sounds like we'll some changes are up front. But uh, before we go there, I want to uh, hear from you, Hans Petter. Yeah. Because um, uh, while it's not sure exactly what these laws specifically needs, um, uh, creates of, of uh, checklists to go through, because uh, um, uh, there are there's some standards out there, uh, uh, and some of them are work in progress. Some of them uh, are best practices. Some of them uh, uh, might, as I understand, might be managed by standarding uh, bodies. Uh, maybe we'll see how that turns out. But we know something already today of how to practice good security. Yeah. Yeah, and and what we can expect that businesses and the uh, open source communities they depend upon might get what type of questions, what type of infrastructure uh, would, do you think would be uh, coming here? Uh, but if a business says, for example, oh, I need to have uh, know w w what's going on when it comes to security updates. Yeah. Could you go a little the, into that? The last couple of years there's been a, a big history of uh, components having security issues like uh, log4j like heartbeat and it, it didn't really matter if you had a good uh, even knowledge base of what software you had installed you had to know how was this software built what are those components um, and it's hard enough today for uh, corporations to have to know all the software that is installed and, and chase down and keep that updated and then having Knowing what components is used, uh, what software used the components log4j um, is hard. Um, this bill calls for a bill of materials, if I understand correctly. <sighs> there's no actual nice legal requirement. No, we, we've not. asked, for, well, some of us. That's asked what for. we're going to need, at least. No, uh, because that's illusionary. I, I would argue it's an illusion. It does not work that well yet unless you do it through procurement. In the US, for example, they do it voluntarily in private contracts. Uh, yeah, you can still lie in them, and yeah, you'll be liable, but you know you have to do the lawsuit afterwards, and then who cares? <laughs> so in procurement, when you know when you do a procurement contract and you oh I, you have to build this thing, then you can somewhat enforce a bill of, of materials. Bill of materials, just for information, is detailing the cybersecurity details and ways it's implemented, a, co a lot of other things, and it's re reminiscent of like it's supposed to be referring to bill of lading from shipping from uh, international private. That's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not that interested no, 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 in no. the liability part of it because I'm more interested in the fact of actually <coughs> being able to fix it mm. and I you need to know the components yeah. to be able to fix it so a bill of materials would be nice to have at least if it's not a requirement that there I can say very quickly about uh, bill of materials there is an aspect uh, that there are already lots of tooling out there that tries to analyze the software stack you're using but that's an insanely complicated um, p landscape to navigate yeah. And it also depends very much on each ecosystem that they depend on. So, for example, me as a Perl uh, person and care caring about CPAN, um, I know that we have the metadata available within our ecosystem, maybe missing a few bits, uh, bits and pieces here and there, but we have the people uh, and the knowledge to add that, what is missing, and produce some output which can be made part into uh, a tooling that helps create a picture like this and and I imagine that any open source community that is so, somewhat organized can help make this happen in some way so for me it's not all just it doesn't have to be a question about liability while uh, there is someone who might be liable but open source has thrived because of cooperation and uh, uh, sharing and uh, people trying to solve the problems that ha they ha need to have solved right in the, with the code in front of them and and uh, that's uh, perhaps enough. I don't know. Uh, the, the the legislation also has a lot of calls for uh, industry best uh, standard, best practices, and stuff like that. And so that's going to be defined uh, in some sub uh, sub pages that are more uh, <laughs> eagerly. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, w we can already know that something uh, like an SQL injection 
is uh, if you have that vulnerability, that's not a state of the art attack <laughs> uh, type. We've been doing that since the 90s. And we, we, the security field has already like, cataloged like, the different ways we are getting attacked. We know very well how we're getting attacked. And we know that a lot of that is not state of the art. Uh, yeah, that's and, and it comes from the name here, Resilience. It's not called the Cyber Security Act, because that's a different act. And that's about Inisa. In the EU, it's about authorities. It doesn't have anything to do with products. But it's about resilience. It's about recovering as well. It's about all the other processes. Security yeah, yeah. isn't just about can we prevent the failure or about the type of attack. It's also about yeah full recovery, yeah. Um, which really that's a very good point. Which the legislation does make a much better attempt of I would argue because uh, the risk and management cycle it describes also in the annex is is is, is what I wish the medical device regulation had. It's yeah. more detailed and, and nice to see. Uh, but but you're right as in the, the standards and the best practice stuff is the usual suspects sadly because the EU was supposed to many years ago in many fields create their own free standards. Did it happen? No. Do we know why? No. <laughs> well, but, actually, uh, we, we've got a reasonably good idea why. Um, but these acts will not make the sysadmins of corporations uh, be um, uh, required to keep their, their software no, no. updated. So, w so there won't be any, s there's no specifics in here. No. Um, so actually it's interesting looking at, the, there's a, the parliamentary committee, the IMCO committee has got its uh, proposed uh, changes and they've inserted lots of references to, to uh, NIST2 and to ANISA in the CRA to, to anchor some of the requirements, some of the protections to those organizations. But basically, this, this, the CRA says, actually, we're not going to tell you how to do it. We're just going to tell you that we're going to whip you if you don't do it. Are we still going to see ATMs with Windows XP on? I, I, oh, I think you know, that it would be, it would be uh, a shame to see them go. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to create the museum for them if they aren't on public display? <laughs> um, so th so th no, the CRA doesn't go in there and, and directly tell you what to do but but what it does do is really for the first time for general software products yeah. it goes and ma gives you a duty it places the requirement on you and then other acts are going to provide the, the stick to beat you and tell you what the mechanisms right. that you must follow are and so so the CRA isn't about those things. One specific question um, do these laws in any way from now on of when they get the, uh, 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 activated um, require businesses to keep their software up to date. So that depends on how you interpret it. So I, as a not so positivistic, but more realism, it's a philosophical direction in law, which is very good with cybersecurity because it's about what can actually be done and how do we do it instead of how do we read it beautifully, which is how law often is, sadly. <laughs> uh, you could definitely read out of it means to, f to you know, for authorities to enforce it in a way where they would argue the up to date part thing is with lifecycle in the CRA does require updates so there will be and you have to service it so it functions as it's supposed to and you know you can't misuse it within some some parameters because liability you can't be liable for someone misusing your product it even states that both early and later luckily like we have we won't have a situation here where it's uh, easy to misuse and not be liable you wish if you misuse or abuse it against the intended purpose you as in the manufacturer won't be liable you will be for the damage you cause so, so the, but, but no, <laughs> as in, not again, it's not technology specifically saying, you must keep it up to date. It's not saying that. No. Because the EU loves technology neutral legislation, which is really but annoying but sometimes. There's, well, there are lots of implications though, right? Well, it, so I wouldn't, so I, 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 I'd, I'd frame it differently to this. I, I, what I would say is there's no express requirement you have to keep your software up to date. However, once you are aware of exploitable vulnerabilities in your software, you have a duty to, to resolve them. Yeah. And that basically and, and, means you and, have to keep it up to date. And that basically does mean you have to keep it up to date. Uh, we're, in the open source community, we're concerned about the way that's been framed because the, the, the writer of the legislation has used a lot of, a, a lot of proprietary software concepts yeah. to, dis to, to explain what they want to do. And consequently, they, they say things like, uh, you c must not release a product with any known vulnerabilities. Right. Well, that's fine if you are if if you, everything is done in secret and then there's this day that the software goes out the door into the public. You c you can deal with that. But if you're an open source community, you can't possibly prevent people from seeing the software that's got known vulnerabilities in it because well, the source code is is in the open and yeah. always has been. And but that that does translate into the businesses who use yes. that software and themselves are actually liable. <laughs> that might be interesting. 
Um, uh, it, yeah. Let's see, we've been uh, chatting now for 45 minutes. Maybe we have room for one or two questions. I, I have an idea. I know where they're coming from. Yes, thank you. My name is Knut Irvin in the Norwegian Irvin. <laughs> And uh, yeah, it's, like, it's great fun when people have jokes about Norwegian being no, nothing, <laughs> because that's the truth. <laughs> uh, that's how we look at ourselves. And I will, I will, because this is, this is what not mentioned, other than indirectly, is the fact that open source licensing says no warranties, but it reflects back on to proprietary software business models that they don't want to take any liability, any charge of anything whatsoever. And that's the business default regarding business-to-business -business software. Yeah. So people talk like free software is bad, and they portray free software as bad, but it's just reflecting business standard. Yeah. And also, when you pay a premium, you don't even pay for fixing the software that has these errors and things we absolutely want to re get rid of because that's the r one of the reasons that we make free software is we can have the right to fix it, which the case is not in proprietary software. You are given a right not to fix it. And you are not warranted then as a producer of software with that kind of licensing to apply to the suggested EU regulation at all. So people, they are inventing free software as bad when the truth are that free software actually give you a right to repair. Also, it kind of entangled a consumer right view, and this is my background in also working in Nokia, so I have some corporate insight. And it's bigger than most, because they were selling hundreds of millions of phones when they were working there. As these questions were erased, or hands were risen, onto this, whom are we giving warranties? Because if we give a warranty and we don't, you know, it's 100 million people, how, gonna, how are we gonna pay for that? Yes. And, and you know, there you have it. So I want you to elaborate on those things, how this, these things okay. put together, thank you. Um, do you want to take several questions, or do you want to? No, uh, uh, if there's one more, I'll okay. start. Because you've, you've, you've got about three people who have been consistently yeah. Be yeah. begging to ask a question. So. Yeah, and I'm, I just have to say, this um, event is being recorded and uh, streamed, so please state your name and uh, be aware yes. that it's been recorded and streamed. And it would be good if you could frame your comments as, at least attempt to frame them in the form of a question. Yeah. Thank you. I'll do my best. Uh, my name is Maddie Neustadt. I'm new to Oslo. I'm an American licensed technology attorney working for a company here in Norway. Welcome. Thank you. Um, and I'm wondering, similarly to some of the questions on warranty and development and ownership, uh, a lot of software these days is being put on a cloud platform. And I know that the Cyber Resiliency Act specifically kind of carves out cloud and pushes it to ANISA, but ANISA only covers infrastructure uh, as critical infrastructure for cloud computing and not necessarily the application and data layers. So I'm curious where you see the warranties flowing under the new laws and regimes um, and liabilities when it comes to application and data layer cloud offerings. Um, so I'll let you comment on warranty. Yeah. Oh, there's another question over one, there. Yeah. <laughs> one, one quick uh, more question and then we'll uh, yeah. answer. Yeah. Three at a time. Thanks. 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 Um, I have a question surrounding or regarding um, country of, orig of origin, because that also is also one of the things coming more and more into focus in all the different types of regulations and directives and also the debate surrounding the, the legislations. And uh, if I recall correctly, there was a, a verdict in the US about 10 years ago where they sort of concluded that the country of compiling is to be concluded as the country of origin. But any thoughts on how that will pan out given the new regulations that are upcoming? So uh, I think as a, that one's really easy, honestly, because this regulation it d doesn't care about the software, it, c it cares about the manufacturer. And consequently, it's, f it's clear that if, there, if a manufacturer offers you software, put, places software on the market in, in the European Union, then they are responsible and there is no question of, the, of where they are located or of the origin of the software. Uh, and I think that that solves all of these questions about country of origin. 
by by CRA exclusively. Yes, yes for the CRA. Bundle. Um, the the, the I, I'm definitely going to let Casper talk about warranty. But uh, the, the the one thing that's happened in the open source community is everyone has said, "Hey, haven't you seen in the BSD there's a disclaimer of warranty?" And um, open source developers kind of assume that by putting things in all caps at the end of the uh, license, they can override national law. And uh, we've had to explain to people that they can only disclaim warranty to the extent that the law allows them to disclaim warranty, and that the CRA uh, prohibits them from disclaiming warranty because you can't disclaim any of those liabilities. And consequently, all of the... Uh, it, I wouldn't talk in terms of a warranty, but I would, talk, I would point out that it's, you can't disclaim your responsibilities under the CRA. If you qualify as a manufacturer of placing product on the market in the European Union, then you have responsibilities under the CRA that will be turned into liabilities under the Product Liability Directive. And there is absolutely no way and no point size of capital that you can use that will solve that problem for you. Uh, but Casper. Yeah, so let me, we'll do, I'll do all three separately because there are some specific comments for each. Um, about the compiling part, uh, so an interesting thing with EU law is that this discussion of service versus product is old and matters to the open source community as well. But in terms of compiling, uh, a lot has happened since then, um, but it would again be about distribution. So even if you compile the US but then send it to the EU, then you, the one that sells it in the EU will be liable because that's a, a distributor liability, which is separate from manufacturer liability. And the CRA also focuses on this because a lot of companies think they can get around of it, around it. But you know, the daughter companies or sister, whoever, whatever they make of structure, someone will still take the bill if something happens. Like you know, it's, you can't distribute products otherwise. Or it will be the, the middleman, the third, the third party. Um, in terms of warranty, uh, oh, what was the question again? I forgot. This, uh, this, in terms of the the war oh yeah the, oh yeah so yeah exactly so this is a this is very complicated again because we're working with 28 different jurisdictions that's the first part second part is this is EU law EU law is supranational it's not national it's super so it's above national law and the obligations given there especially in regulations but some directives are really really sharp and will give similar obligations in all countries some of them not that many but some but no you cannot get around uh, responsibility just because you write in your contract. For that reason, one, so supranationality, EU law doesn't care about you, it's gonna force its way through. Two, uh, you're doing, let's say it's at a consumer, or it's a consumer law applies. Uh, yeah, you know, that, depending on the country, but if you go by your rules, yeah, they, they will, it will be more lenient. And for that matter, normal obligations law or law of contracts or whatever you call it in each jurisdiction will also apply. So if you write something and you don't force them to read and understand it, it won't apply one to one in the way you thought it did. So writing a nice license for open source software and then making you scroll down isn't the same as, as the other party understanding it. And especially not if they're consumer and they won't understand it all. And as I said, EU law invalidates all of it anyway. But so there's basically a three step or two step process that you have to go through to check whether or not it even matters what you write when you make free and open source software. But on, and also to keep the <laughs> warranty part, so warranty makes me more think about, uh, you know, making sure that the, it's in, if the product fails or something, and then you want to deliver it back and, and so on. But yeah, in, in this context, if we think about the contractual parts, then yeah, no, you're not going to get anywhere with, with that, no matter what you do. The boilerplate clauses, aka standard yes. contracts, and they won't meaningless. Yes. And then there was a question about the cloud uh, being a yes. Uh, yeah. So so on cloud, it, it, um, it, it's reasonable to assume that the CRA does. The CRA excludes software as a service from its scope. Uh, it's reasonable to assume that we will be seeing some fresh legislation fairly soon that will be doing both cloud and AI regulation. Uh, and I say that that's a reasonable assumption because I've seen it, so I know that it's coming. <laughs> um, so it's definitely coming. But yes, it's temporarily, in the same way that medical appliances and mobile phones and automobiles are excluded from the CRA despite having digital <laughs> elements. So software as a service is going to be covered under cloud regulations and under AI regulations. Yeah. That was one I forgot to mention at the start. AI Act is also worth mentioning here for the free open source software because we have equivalents in, AI, yeah. in the AI space too that are really important. Right. Uh, but, but to add to the cloud part, the answer until then becomes very complicated because it depends again then on jurisdiction. Because <laughs> uh, you know then it would be about uh, uh, obligations between different parties doing different things at the same time with privacy on top, security on top. Yeah, it gets really complicated. So we, we will look forward to it. Yeah, but I, I assume that's why it's been carved out is because yeah. it would be very... The, the CRA is quite elegant in many ways because it, because it, it uses the 
the the, the placing on the market as the trigger for the uh, for the legislation. It's it's quite clean in terms of its ability to be to deal with uh, with uh, supranational issues and to deal with the origin of supply issues by by saying well we don't really care about any of that all we care is that it was placed on the market who placed it on the market for Europeans to use and, and and they're the people who've got the responsibility and then we'll let them it'll be the first time in history trickle down has worked <laughs> we'll, we'll see the responsibility trickle down the open source movement hopefully accompanied by money uh, um, uh, let's switch around a little bit now let's take the perspective of uh, a business that is um, uh, these laws apply to. They suddenly g get a bunch of new laws that uh, they have to understand, figure out how to, uh, you know, how to respond to them and what n new demands they have to fulfill. Lots of businesses already are under some kind of regime. Like if you go to the fintech world, they know a lot about uh, audits and uh, traceability in code and uh, all that stuff that's uh, important. And so for, I'm, I'm imagining this, like the amount of work they need to do is n not as big as maybe other businesses that are suddenly being introduced to uh, these, these laws for the first time. Um, uh, but now that they get these new laws, they will, uh, let's assume for a moment, they manage to get a full picture of all their dependencies they, through some magical means called the Software Bill of Materials. Um, uh, and they figure out that they have a an, an large amount, maybe uh, certainly more than half of what they do uh, has some open source dependencies that they need to keep track of. Um, what sh should these businesses and institutions, tr how should they approach uh, open source communities? Because right now they have a business going on, they have maybe even shareholders that they're uh, um, need to be um, accountable to and and now they have to talk with uh, a completely heterogeneous uh, global com uh, it's not even fair to call it a community it's like literally tens of thousands of tiny communities yeah, it's a community of communities of communities yes like there are, li there are at least three levels of of communities yeah. and meta communities even cpan yeah, CPAN itself has like a, a, a few tens of thousands of modules. Each of those you could consider have a community. Maybe it's only a community of one, but it's at least a few people who care about it. So, so I, I, you know, I think that's a fantastic question. Uh, I don't think that there's... Uh, it, for some com communities, it's a lot clearer what will go on. So for, for the Java community, <laughs> I think the Java community has got a much clearer structure do you know where they're stuff big is also, from. and they have and, lots of and, resources. And they've they've been used to creating sealed packages and uh, for distribution up until now. I think the the, the, the communities that are going to have a really serious problem are the ones with dynamic dynamic loading repositories, like CPAN or or like uh, uh, um, Node, yeah, uh, PyPy, or, Pi, or PyPy. All of those communities. Uh, it, it isn't so much the fact that, it, that it's a dynamic loading environment. It's that that dynamically loading environment has been used extensively to create a cascade of dependencies yeah. where uh, you know a, a node package may it can turn out to have dependencies that are like five layers down yeah. that, that you've absolutely no clue somebody decided they would use the sort function in in that package over there that actually does color spectral analysis and you discover you're loading a color spectrum analysis package from that server over in that place over there uh, you've no real way of ever knowing it with Node, so I think that oh, like it's possible to chicken, figure out. But the uh, chickens we thought were going to come home to ro ro to roost with things like Node, I think, are about to come home to roost because people are going to have to identify those chickens and put leg rings on. But how should businesses uh, approach this? Because they might look at this new landscape with lots of moving parts and individuals and small groups each of them having different kinds of motivations, some of them just for fun, others because they, they work for a, uh, an employer that needs something done, others just uh, are doing it as part because their pro uh, professor asked to, to do yeah. solve a problem at school or at uni. Uh, and still, it's in use. Like, sh should a business just say, I can't do this, I'm going to outsource it to uh, large providers like uh, Red Hat or Tidelift. Tidelift. Tidelift are are on this already. They are ready to take your. That's money. about financing, though. Yes. 
but but it, but, it, but they are they are they are right there ready to take your money to solve to take this pain away from you and i think we will we will for those places where there are dynamic loading environments and cascades of dependencies i think we will quickly see intermediaries come in place who will give you a warranty yeah so that means um if some student writes something interesting for, uh, as part of their class uh, cur curriculum uh, or whatever they're being asked to do, uh, publishes it, some business that uh, uh, decides to use it as part of, part of some critical infrastructure, uh, so there suddenly becomes a, a, like a, a, mo a need to look at liability and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that, that suddenly that, that student needs to think about like, okay, well, how do I handle liability? Well, I don't think they do because, uh, because they will not be the manufacturer of putting the product on the market in Europe. Right. The person who will need to worry about the liability is, is Nokia. <laughs> to worry about their liability. And Nokia will go find a service provider who will make sure that they do not have a liability problem. And it may be that service provider will provide them with a version of CPAN where uh, How about uh, the only a fifth of the pack, only a fifth of the, the products are there, because all the ones written by that student won't be get that service provider won't let their filter pass through the things where they their insurer won't let them take a risk on the ability to fix problems in a timely so way. So some insurers might come and say, no, this is a good open source software and that is not a good open source software. I don't think they'll say that. I think what they'll what they'll do is they'll look at the processes of the intermediary that wants the uh, the, the, the wants the insurance, and they will check whether those processes go check whether there it is written by a dog in a in a kennel or by a team of developers in Latvia or whether it's written by. But you know, shouldn't this be more about what the software does instead of who writes it? Well, I think that the who who is able to um, warrant that they're doing it in a safe way is almost as important as what it does. Um, uh, although I, I made up, I may, you know, I'm amongst security professionals here, but I, I think that uh, that if you select your packages purely on the the function, uh, it's possible you may be exposing yourself to risk because you never know which um, which country is hosting the people writing that software and what it will do when you finally come to distribute your product. Uh, I'll the first. So, so this legislation is taking. Uh, effect and being created when the budget for the year has already been decided that yes. there's no money for any of this anyway. Yes. So the companies are going to go like, what happened? Uh, this was yes. too fast. We didn't. We are not going to acknowledge that this exists <laughs> for at least a year. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and they will go and but, not understand. But it's even better than that because the product liability directive isn't going to create the liability until it's transposed into national law. Mm. And it's not going to be transposed into national law. Yeah, but, uh, for, years. <laughs> for, for, for two to three years after after being promulgated, yeah, uh, I have to disappoint you. <laughs> the old product liability can still apply to this uh, and okay. will apply to it. Yes, it's, uh, and it will do it in an individualized way, where especially in Scandinavia, because we have also in Germany, but we have a longer tradition than, for example, Bulgaria with product liability. We, you know, we started doing it, you know, around the start of the last minute. So, so we've been on it for a while, and it and, and that so it means there's no th someone is going to be okay. responsible in, there. In this time frame, yeah. the, there's a, a valid, o a, a great opportunity for um, advisories and consultancies to make a lot of money on telling people totally what is it. a good idea. Yeah. Um, and it will take some time before yeah. they know what to do. But for the love of God, make stuff machine readable. Yeah. Uh, if anything. All those lessons you learned when GDPR was, was being done about going out and making money, giving expert consulting, yes. same lessons apply here. <laughs> But, but to add, you mentioned critical infrastructure. If you imagine the business also had to do with that, that's where the NIS 2 directive comes in. One, because the, each state will likely, hopefully, standardize the way they, they talk about how to use open source in critical infrastructure. We'll see if they do or not, but if by the, by the wording right now, it sounds a little bit more like it's up to each country. But let's imagine that. So th then the business has to also follow that advice, which is usually just, as, as, as Simon actually mentioned, obviously, good software is good software, but be, be very, very, very sure before you use this dependency. Like, really, really sure if you, if you can and have the resources for it. The other part is that the CRA is built up quite logically and rationally in terms of why you're doing this security and how. Like, as in, obviously, it's not technology-specific enough to say do this and this and this, but it, it goes quite far. And if you read Annex 1, 
it has like an insanely good short description of how to have a good life cycle and what to focus on like yeah. security wise so it's, it's not bad so for me uh, when we, if we take a step back yeah. to the business who look, get, looks at this new legislation and has to try to interact with the open source community yeah it's still a, that means you have a motivation and a checklist maybe from uh, those laws mm -hmm. and then you, you find the right person in whatever communities you need to find it and that might be in tens or hundreds of different places and then have a conversation mm. and that's literally just the way to do it is the open source way but where you have a, a motivated participant now with a new type of motivation yes. uh, that would that comes from legislation instead of from business needs it yeah. comes from fear instead of from good <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah but uh, but, uh, but uh, do they have uh, do, can, uh, can we expect businesses to say I, we don't have any developers in house, but uh, but right. we still need something well, solved. What what should they do? So uh, that, 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 let's just roll back a little to the, what the real question is. So the right. real question is, how do you comply with the CRA? Uh, and you comply with the CRA very in a very similar way to the way that you might do other business quality compliance. What you do is you say, I've got processes set up that are going to deal with these things as they arise. So what that CE mark on the, on, that you put on the software actually means is I certify that I have in place processes that will mean that none of the risks that the CRA deals with will harm my customers. Right. And, and that's what you're actually saying. So, the, so when it first comes into, into force, recognizing that the product liability hasn't actually caught up and recognizing that national enforcement bodies have actually not been resourced, you're probably fairly safe to say, you know, for a little while, I, you least. know, for a little while, I look at my existing processes, and they seem to meet all the things that are in Annex One, and I'm just going to self-certify as CE as, as C compliant because I don't have a critical product. Now, it's different rules apply if you have a critical product, but if you don't have a critical product, you can just say, yeah, I think I, I, th I think I do all that. And how uh, do you know if you have a critical product? Well, that's. That, that, yeah. That's carefully defined yeah. in the okay. CRA. Yes. So Could quickly do that. Yeah. <laughs> Give them some examples. Yeah. So <laughs> a critical critical infrastructure is obviously the things that make society run. So obviously, if you deliver software specifically for hospitals, and no, this won't make Windows critical infrastructure. Yeah. But if you make custom for it, like if you make something custom for it in any way, so that can be surgery robots, uh, pacemakers, because they're part of the greater infrastructure. That be it, electricity, water plants, everything that you logically would think of critical infrastructure usually is now. Facebook isn't, <laughs> even though for some people it is critical in their lives. That being so, said, social media is mentioned though. Yeah, but not as an actual critical yeah, infrastructure. Okay. But well. it, it's about messaging services. It's about like conveyors there. Yes, but but not 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 literally. Yeah. Uh, so so the challenge here yeah. is there's lots of things that that we do care about. Probably people in ISOC Norway care about our critical infrastructure. So the DNS is definitely critical infrastructure. Yes. Uh, um, uh, domain is name system is uh, definitely yeah, yeah, so mm. boundary routing is definitely critical infrastructure yeah. uh, which is a shame because it's really <coughs> very good um, so uh, there are definitely things that are critical infrastructure and critical infrastructure needs to either comply with national standards that re relate to the area that is uh, uh, involved or you need to get a third party audit of the processes that you have in place to protect your customers. And that is the most worrying thing for open source communities. That's what's got Eclipse, for example, writing to the commission saying, hey, you can't do this to us. That's what's got NL Labs and, and ISC and other organizations very concerned, is that although they will not have revenue streams that justify and fund those audits, nonetheless, the CRA makes them have to perform those audits yeah. because they appear to f come with f under the wire of, uh, of placing on the market in the EU, and they are also supplying critical infrastructure. Uh, now we're actually talking about more about open source projects that have been become so uh, uh, used, or so yes. common, and so uh, uh, well known and established that they are completely. But everywhere. It, it can happen to anybody. You know, um, yeah. I don't know if you remember when um, when Facebook had a big outage recently. Uh, uh, Facebook, uh, <laughs> well, face, Facebook, uh, it, it's a great story. Facebook um, uh, uh, updated their, uh, their boundary routing, and yeah. suddenly nobody could reach Facebook because the boundary routing was in error. 
and they tried to get access to the server facility to go and roll back the change, and the door locks on the server facility used their single sign-on system, <laughs> and they couldn't actually get into the building, and somebody had to go and cut a hole in the wall with a with a, an angle grinder so they could get in <laughs> to go change the system. So um, Facebook could be critical infrastructure to some people. If, yeah. it's, you know, if, if it's being used for single sign-on in an area that r rises to the threshold. So you can't just say that something isn't going to be critical infrastructure. You've actually got to go and check yeah. whether, you know, uh, did we decide to make um, uh, the, the, all the door locks in this 50-person apartment block use a piece of software running on a Raspberry Pi? Um, well, if we did that, it's critical infrastructure, and I've suddenly got a set of liabilities that need auditing by a third party. So, the, so that sounds like uh, proper risk assessment is a core part of anything around this. Yes. And what does that what does that mean? Like, if a business suddenly gets a, uh, an idea that oh, maybe I have some critical infrastructure that is involved here, the risk assessment that's like asking what type of questions and then. Figuring out, please have oh, yeah, a very quick overview. Like what does that mean? Due diligence, like uh, having a map of what can go wrong and what have you done to try to mitigate those situations. Uh, like really think about the uh, error conditions based on your functions. It's it's uh, basic stuff, uh, but more people should do it. Yeah, uh, it's just like well, if these types of errors happen, uh, what are the consequences, basically? Yeah. Yeah, and just going through all of them. It's quite typical for a, a authentication system uh, to have this thinking that you shouldn't rely on the authentication system and needing that to be able to fix the authentication system. Right. It's that's so that might be a, a type of question. So, uh, so that means basically. Uh, these laws are coming, and businesses have to do some serious introspection on what the risks yeah. are. And we're ready for, for that. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's also business and business here. Yes. <laughs> yes. Bring, your Bring it on. Yeah. Bring your stuff. <laughs> yeah. You had a question there? Yeah, oh. there's another one. Yeah. Huh? And this is bringing into another angle on this, because of the world situation where Taiwanese companies has been said you can't provide phone infrastructure to Europe or to the United States. You can't buy anything from China, even if they are using open source. And they kind of themselves are putting onto Android on their stuff or in the phone carrier they put into open source inside a phone central. And 10, 12 years ago, I was in China, 15 years ago, and I talked to them when they did 2G. And they didn't understand anything about software. But now, this is a world thing. So my question is uh, how this new regulation will then compute regarding the rest of the world, because basically we'll, you will let people out and in, yeah. who are going to get and who is not going to provide you with software. Um, I, I mean, let's face it, um, you know, uh, well, actually, you're, you're Danish, so you're, mm. you're, you're, you're an EU citizen. Yes. But most of us aren't actually in the EU, so we're actually already in a third country. Ah, but we tend to say Norwegians are the but best Europeans because even though they're not oh, uh, in the EU, they well, implement it better than we do. You know, as as you <laughs> as you know, Britain has just opted in to be regulated without being consulted as well. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the club. Yes, great. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so, so to that's actually it's quite interesting because uh, this legislation we're talking about today is partially product. CR is mainly product, uh, but the rest would be more in the angle of. Na you know, nationally, what are you going to do to protect the infrastructure or with the Digital Markets Act, how are you going to control what type of market you want or you don't want? We should talk a little bit about that as well. So the choice of software is a political decision, but I, what, what, what I heard there also was that it uses free and open source code to do it. So there wouldn't be anything in the legislation that prevents another manufacturer from take, taking their, their own version of that and then you know, implementing it in, in whatever way they suit. In that sense, the CRA is quite ruthless because it's about you know, manufacturer, it's up to you. So as much as, so we talked about the free and open source developers maybe being harassed or 
for that matter, when, the, when, you, when these companies want to get something out of them, they, they, to me, they should be humble and, and you know, come, come with peace <laughs> and money, hopefully. And that way, we'd be able to solve things more amicably than, than, than just trying to force ourselves into it. But I, I agree with Salva that the writing is perhaps a bit annoying in the CRA because it could lead to a situation where yet developers will not have a good time with you know, manufacturers harassing them over the component that they specifically yeah. maintain. Again, a one-guy situation around the world, too, for that matter. Yeah. But, but the answer to that was basically, polit it's a political decision with software choice slash company choice or preventing one country not doing something. But on the other hand, there are back doors, for sure, yeah. as it usually is. So um, uh, before we open up for um, a conversation with uh, uh, participants in, in, in the room here, um, uh, is there an, is there anything we should do, um, ask or expect or hope for the different open source partic um, participants or practitioners or communities to, to think like what's a good approach to take f uh, uh, for somebody who just wants to write some code and now sees this in the horizon is, is, should they be worried? Uh, is there something they can start doing already now? Are there some coordination efforts that needs to start? What do you guys think? Uh, well, it depends on whether they're in the EU or not. Or if they have uh, uh, users that are uh, well, making something for someone in the EU? Well, I'm, not, well, I'm, I'm less worried about that. Uh, the things that you can personally do, if you happen to be an EU citizen, that means you have an MEP. This bill is currently in review in Parliament. And those MEPs very much welcome guidance from citizens. I, I have written to my MP about this. Yes, yes I recommend. Uh, so if anyone uh, here is in the lucky position of still having an MEP, um, then then you should possibly. But that, that's a little bit of a, a yeah. short uh, deadline. But that, that's, a, that's a very short deadline. I'm very happy to catch people up on, 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 on the state of play at the moment as well. In, in terms of the, the wider question, um, I think open source communities. Uh, I, so I don't think, I think we're going to get this to the point where the individual developer uh, who is not placing software on the market in the European Union needs to worry particularly about the CRA. I think yeah. we'll, we'll get that, th that sorted, honestly. Though they're strictly not placing anything, they are just publishing. Yeah, well, we have to work out how to, how to get an understanding with the Commission and the Parliament so that the wording doesn't even appear to implicate them. Right. Uh, now, assuming we do all that, the main consequence is going to be open source communities are going to have lots of people downstream expecting there to be a software bill of materials yeah. and expecting that software bill of materials to contain information that will give them the confidence to place a CE mark on their software. And uh, for some communities, that will be quite welcome to actually have their users talk to them for the first time, uh, maybe invest in their communities, maybe... Uh, be willing to to talk to, to uh, hire developers even. Yeah. Uh, for other communities, that will be unwelcome because uh, I, there was a, a great blog post uh, that someone did a, a little while back where he said, "I am not your supplier." He said that that uh, he's he really wants you to understand that that your role in using my software is no different from uh, from a rat to digging in the bin outside my house looking for something tasty to eat. You know, I have, I've, taken, I've written my software, I've put it out, I have no intention of being your supplier under any circumstances. I don't want your money. I, I, all I did was I put it under the BSD license so that anyone could use it. And if you want to use it, you knock yourself out and use it. I am not going to give you an S-bomb because I am not your supplier. Yeah. And I think there's going to be quite a few people who, who see themselves in that position. Uh, but I think in the larger communities, uh, in, you know, I'm expecting in the Python community, I'm expecting in the Java community, I'm expecting probably in the Perl community, although you're, a, you're a wilder than others, um, I, I'm expecting to see a responsible uh, a structure put in place to deal with downstream requesting upstream information on the uh, cyber safety of, of components. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I, but I think communities have to be ready for it because there is going to be, uh, there are going to be a lot of people downstream who are suddenly going to take an interest in who is upstream and you need to be ready to answer their questions is yeah. I think the biggest thing. For, for the individual developer, um, it's about writing 
good software. It's about following the, the things you're already following. Like thinking about this as if it's going to ruin philosophy or the, mo the reasoning why you're doing behind it. Th that shouldn't happen. That's not the point here. But if it can be reasonably fixed, again, and morally speaking, especially if it relates to a lot of devices, it would be nice. But again, I, as I said earlier, humble and lots of money would be a better approach. But even then, if you can potentially, let's just say, save lives or at least save financial damage from you changing a little bit in your component or you're dependent, that, that's good. Like I wish this, this, this legislation is not telling you to do that as such, but that would be ideal. Now, uh, I would prefer that there was a remuneration mechanism and all this, but the problem is just the EU doesn't have this much power because of the EU treaty. So you're in a situation where the competence of each con country prevent the EU from perhaps doing a way of redistributing money or something else that could help uh, yeah, the individual developer in a few So in a sense, context. it's actually a little bit also up to the businesses to start uh, uh, caring about their own uh, upstream dependencies. Yes. Um, so for example, is it sensible for a business to start looking at, at the different open source communities to hire someone? Is that meaningful, like to have an actual representative in-house that can be a liaison towards uh, some uh, community that they have a heavy dependency on, for example? Uh, or or should, do we need to look at uh, ways to uh, do small funding? Like there, there are already grant systems in place, many places. Um, uh, uh, but that, to me, it sounds like uh, uh, if you want money, then you can ask for it. And that's almost like taking off your hat and going up to someone and say, do you have some money for some open source development, please? And that sounds like a very off putting uh, power relationship. Like you would, somebody who uses your software it shouldn't uh, come and demand really yeah. much. It's more about uh, helping and sharing in the open source community. Well, I'd, I'd hope that would be the result, but the, the rest would be obviously forking. So you end up in a situation where they might even hire or take part of the community away to make their own version of those dependencies. Yeah. Um, or more maliciously than that, like for example, companies outside the EU providing these services and then sending this back to the manufacturers who then benefit from this. So there might be some malicious, some, some not so nice things may happen exactly because of this and exactly with the reason, well, with the bad, with a bad intention in the first place. So, but ideally, yes. But again, as I said, EU is limited. Like they, I, I don't, as, as, as Simon put it, there are some people that really love free and open source software that have written this. So had they had the opportunity to make a mechanism or start a mechanism, I think they would have done so. Mm. But they're limited because it's yeah. the EU. Uh, one perspective I'm, I'm personally worried about has to do with the amount of businesses now that will suddenly be aware that they have uh, an open source dependency. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, can, um, uh, I saw a number uh, a while back that just for the CRA, it was uh, in the order of, I think it was, 40,000 businesses just in Germany that would be affected by this. And uh, if you just look at what kind of typical dependency tree they have inside one of those businesses, and you average it out through everyone, you can see that qu quite a substantial amount of these might uh, suddenly be interested in one or more or a few open source communities that are of some size. Possibly, but they would have to be placing software on the European market to actually take an interest. Because remember that using open source to build your products, uh, particularly if they're software as a service products, doesn't actually Im imply you in any responsibilities under the CRA. No. So the, the, I, 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 I'm, I'm not terribly concerned yeah. about that particular aspect. I think that for most users of open source software, they're using it for internal systems. Uh, and uh, they almost certainly will not be in a position where they're placing on the market and have to put a C mark on their work. I think that for the organizations that are uh, placing software on the market, they're typically doing it as a, as a service yeah. rather than as a distributed binary. And so I, I think the people who, are, who should be most concerned are the uh, companies who are creating devices and embedding firmware yeah. and the companies who are using open source software uh, for their software products and not taking their responsibilities to the community seriously. And this and is all for the CRA. And this is all for just the CRA. And I don't think there are actually very many of them. I think that, that, m that most companies have worked out that they need to have an OSPO, that they need to take a responsibility towards their critical down upstreams. I, uh, so I, 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 don't, I don't feel it's going to be a massive impact. Yeah. Well, um, I'm also thinking about the NIST2 directive, because that's, uh, it's, 
it comes in addition in, in my mind. Uh, uh, but um, uh, um, so there's a critical infrastructure this bit there also, which has exactly the same situation where they have lots of the open source dependencies. So for me, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gracefully ignoring what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> And saying that I want to be worried anyway. Yeah, you, uh, can, be, you can be worried. Yeah, so on behalf of everyone, of, of these people. But uh, um, but you mentioned uh, an interesting term here, and that's an OSPO. Could you very quickly tell me us what that is? So uh, uh, it's an open source program office. It's uh, when a company recognizes that there is a strong dependency on open source software in their business. Uh, when you have a dependency on open source software in your business, you have a number of uh, um, behaviors that it's wise to adopt. One of them is to be in a good relationship with the upstream suppliers of your software. And so responsible businesses uh, have an employee who has a relationship with the places the software is coming from. So if you're using a lot of Perl software in your business, you really should have somebody who's a member of the Perl community on your staff. And that person, rather than necessarily working in a particular subdivision of the company, might well work in a centralized office reporting to the CTO or reporting to another C-level function that has responsibility for your compliance with open source software licenses, your relationships with your upstream communities, uh, and now your compliance with the CRA and with uh, your um, uh, public position with regard to open source. So that's, it's typically the group that will run your um, company.com slash open source page right. where people go to find out whether you're a good citizen or whether, whether you're pretending to be a good citizen or not. Yeah, uh, so, that, so an OSPO is a very, now a very common thing in, in larger companies. It's becoming common in smaller companies as well. There is now a European Union OSPO. So the European Commission has got a, an open source program office that coordinates all of their activities with open source. And uh, what, what, the, what would be a sensible lower bar? Like, for, uh, how many uh, employees uh, in a business would you think is now it's time to think about this? What's the what criteria right. you have to? Well, you, look you're, into? You, so so I used to run. I ran one of the first open source program offices in the in the industry back in two thousand and four, um, and so there was me. Uh, I had uh, someone on my staff who looked after our internal open source community, ran internal events. Uh, I had uh, an attorney assigned to me out of the uh, general counsel's office who was responsible for our open source license compliance. Um, I had somebody who was responsible for our outward facing um, uh, uh, appearance re regarding open source, which because because the company in question was some microsystems, we had a fairly rocky relationship initially. Oh. Um, so I had at peak about seven people and that was in a company that was uh, with a nearly six-figure number of employees. Yeah, uh, so it doesn't need to be a very big, op a very big function. Yeah, but the, but it it will need to have it, it's company less, size. It's less a number of people. It's more a range of what the the competences that need to be represented. Right. And you need to. It isn't open source is not a legal matter. Uh, it uses law legal licenses as a as a tool as a trick in order to uh, um, uh, create some freedoms for the software to exist in. So you, you do need some legal understanding, but you mustn't let it be a division of the general counsel's office, because if you do, your OSPO will turn into a dead letter that kills your company. Uh, but, it, but you need to have a legal competence, you need to have a marketing competence, you need to have an internal process compliance competence, and you need to have a reporting line into your C-level executives, because without that, what will happen is the things you need to fix in the company will typically be where you do something which is really bad, looks really bad to open source communities, and you need to have the reporting line that will let you go and let the CEO stop that thing from happening, even though you're not in the reporting chain of the company of the bit of the company that is doing it. So those are the critical competencies. You need legal, you need marketing, you need internal process, and you need executive oversight. Uh, and the, what is the size of the company was what I, what I meant to ask. Like it, it, if you are a company of size 100 or 1,000, 10,000, roughly when do you, should you or ought you to think about OSPOs? Uh, you probably need an OSPO once you are um, what the European Union would describe as a medium business. Okay. Um, so okay, which is, is around about 250 employees. Okay. Uh, so that's, that, you, and that would probably be 
uh, a member of staff who's got responsibility for open source, they'd be your open source oh. officer, and they'd have a dotted line into someone in your, because you, you, at that size company, you'll probably have a legal counsel with outside counsel. Right. So they'll have a, a relationship with the general counsel, and they'll have a relationship with your marketing function. And they might have an assistant, so they'd be, it'd be a two-person yeah. offspot. And it's also kind of dependent on to what extent you do in-house development. Yes. We're using open source software, and if you don't, then it's, it doesn't And that some of the larger companies are now getting rid of their OSPOs again. They've been right. through the cycle, they've had the OSPO, and they're now building the function into the, the, the groups where it, it is relevant. Which I quite like that as an idea. You know, the, I, the old there's that old joke that if a company has a quality department, that means it's the only place where there's any quality. <laughs> and um, uh, similarly, you might feel the same about NOS. But so I quite like the idea of it being folded back into the company once it's mature. Um, uh, we're uh, nearing our end. Uh, it's still a little bit while. There, there are questions. Yes, uh, but I've before we go to, to the uh, our audience here, are there any final uh, thoughts and points we, uh, that are said that we would like to to make sure are being said? Should we talk about the Digital Markets Act or should we shelve that? I'd shelve that. So the the Digital Markets Act. So I don't care about the Digital no. Markets Act because it doesn't affect open source. Indeed. So so yeah. other people care about it, but I don't care about it. But the Digital Markets Act is going to be a great thing because it is going to uh, to unlock the walled gardens of app stores and it is going to uh, make uh, instant messaging interoperable across vendors uh, by law and it's going to do many other wonderful things that unfortunately no one actually knows how to do. And so the workshops in, in Brussels have been fascinating about it. But it doesn't have an open source aspect, so honestly, I, I don't care, Casper. Only part that would have perhaps an open source aspect would be that we can force the platforms to, speaking of having a good relationship with the open source community, have that, because else they can't fulfill the act. But yes. other than that, at, the, at the moment, they're not being terribly nice about <laughs> that, I've discovered. No. Uh, the, I mean, the one thing I would say is, I, I, the, the quote I gave you didn't involve rats. Yes, <laughs> OK. Uh, it's, he said, I'm not your supplier, so all your supply chain ideas you're not buying from a supplier. You are a raccoon digging through dumpsters for free code, oh, he yeah. said. Much better. <laughs> Which is much better. <laughs> much nicer. Well, how, how, how will this be audited and enforced? Well, which one of them? Uh, the, yeah. Uh, yes. the CE <laughs> marking, basically. Oh, so CE marking in the EU has two levels, essentially, in most prog legislation. And in EU, we have notified bodies, which is the ones that test. But as mentioned, a lot of people and a lot of products are self-certified so until you know it's an assumption that they will you know conform yeah but it does work a lot of the time and again the EU is the leading place in the world for this for some reason <laughs> but basically with, with this you have notified bodies and the notified bodies can test and will test and notified bodies are interesting because in the EU we allow private notified bodies you'd think it's all public no most of them are private both in medical devices cars in this case, two most likely. And then the next level will be the authority. So the authority will be on top and will do sometimes sweeps, auditing, whatever. They're very free. They can do quite a lot of different things. So it's up to each country's authority what will happen here. Uh, but then the next level of auditing will be companies are obviously interested in knowing this before it happens. So they want to do audits, you know, third party audits themselves before then, which is where we can come in and, and do and do work. Um, so, so the auditing would hopefully be, you know, the technical aspects of penetration testing and, and all the other standard security uh, things in terms of, you know, ex ante or ex post, as I said, before the adversary attacks or after the adversary attacks. Should, should so open on. source communities uh, do auditing of their users? <sighs> Not their users. So that's kind of, so that depends. Some, op some free open source software communities will be included by the CRA, some clearly won't. So that even from the current text, yeah. there will still be some lines. But as we talked about here, it can be hard to decipher. And honestly, I wish we had a, a couple of good academic papers that could agree on just the academics view on this. We don't. So it's very annoying. Yeah. But yeah, if you're in a certain size, then, then I don't see why not. Because from a security perspective, you'd want these things to be as good as possible. And you all, on the other hand, you want them to be as good as possible to deal with the outcome when it fails. So. In some ways, yes, of course, because in, in the end, you know, we want the best security possible for everyone else's sake and ourselves. Yeah. So the other thing that's going to happen is uh, the way that you can demonstrate compliance with uh, EU regulations is by complying with uh, standards that have the, with European standards. Right. Now there are no European standards in this area at the moment, and so the CRA. 
uh, uh, cr creates the possibility that the European Union will request standards for cybersecurity. So the and ISO will come in and... Well, it won't be, I, won't be I, I've got, it's actually even worse than that. Uh, it won't be ISO that comes in, it will either be Sen Senelec or it will be ETSI because they are the two European standards organisations. And so there is the prospect of ETSI producing a standard for uh, software <laughs> cyber, for cyber security, which I think would be uh, gruesome in the extreme. And so we'll have to pay a, a larger amount just to read the text and that's that stuff mm -hmm. going on here? Uh, uh, well, ETSI doesn't charge for, the, for okay. their standards. But um, there, you, it will happen in they, they have the course. disadvantage that, that it's extremely difficult for open source organizations to be a member. So OSI is a, is a member of Etsy at the moment. Uh, but I think it's very unlikely that any other community is going to join. And so the, the standard will be written by organizations that don't really like open source very much. And it's likely that cybersecurity rate standards will therefore not be terribly compatible with the way that open source projects see the world. Oh, so that is actually one of my big... So the, this, this session started out asking, is EU regulation going to kill open source? And the most likely vector by which that, would ha that will happen is by cybersecurity standards being written by an organization that wants to kill open source. And that organization is Etsy. Right. And, and then there's a final comment. The good part about EU law is we can talk in, about purposes and spirit of the law. They really matter in EU law. And such standards that kill critical, essentially parts of the whole society or organism that is this, this community will be against the spirit of this kind of legislation. So if that happens, other actions must be taken to prevent it killing open source in this situation. Oh. So that's the good part about EU law is at least, you know, it cares about not, you, you can't go against the purpose of the legislation, yeah. the spirit of legislation, which is here, more resilience. So, won't create so more resilience, but creating, ruining the community that creates the resilience in the first place, or 60% of it. So it's not quite yet time to run into a corner and start crying. <sighs> mm. You can always sit and yeah, cry yeah. in a corner. <laughs> You've got a couple of years before that. Okay, that's good. Uh, um, let's open the floor for some questions. Uh, I think we have a few minutes for that. Uh, Matt Egan, and I'm, I'm wondering from a practical standpoint, um, if we look at EU enforcement for, say, the GDPR, um, they're not starting by going to finding individual developers doing small-scale business to do this. So I don't, I don't think anybody's going to be scrubbing GitHub for bits of open source that are being developed that don't have a CE mark in order to issue fines. Um, but I also think that the main remedy they have is fines and monetary damages and isn't a practical solution just for some of the open source communities to incorporate into nonprofits with lack of revenue so that there's nothing to go after? Um, so many of the open source communities are already in that position. It's um, the larger ones. Yes. Yeah. The uh, problem is that the size range is um, enormous. Uh, b b possibly. Um, it, it all depends yeah. on how the PLD ends up uh, 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 apportioning liability. Uh, if, the, if all of the liability involved is uh, as a percentage of the, of the sale price, we're all, we're all, we're all good. If it is uh, a, a proportional to revenues, it could actually be very pretty serious for a small nonprofit, because it could result in in uh, because all of their revenues are to do with paying staff to do administrative functions typically, and uh, they could well find themselves in a position where they're wiped out by one claim. Um, so so there is there is going to be a bit of a, a a bit of a concern in that area, I think, and I think that's why uh, so. There was, we wrote a letter last week, 12 open source charities wrote a letter last week to the European Commission asking them, pretty please, would they like to ask us a few questions about this legislation before they promulgate it? Uh, we'll see whether anybody replies. I have a hunch. That we, oh. What do you think? Is I, I, I really hope so. Because I really hope they would, reply. Yeah. But so if you want to go find that, there's a, it's been doing the rounds on the news. Uh, the, it's 12 open source organizations write to the European Commission about, and it says it's about the CRA expressly, but it's it's deeper than that. It's about saying, please, will you not legislate about open source without talking to open source charities? Because the only way that the European Union knows how to consult at the moment is with civil society organisations, aka consumer groups, or with corporations. And open source isn't developed by either. Open source is developed by what many people call the fourth sector. Uh, it is by ordinary citizens in various relationships to the code and to other organizations. 
and they're typically not represented by a trade union or by a consumer group or by a company. And the, the European Commission made absolutely no attempt to communicate with the, the open source fourth sector for any of this legislation. They actually went out of their way to communicate with, with small and medium enterprises. Uh, they, they sought them out even when they failed to respond to the inquiries. <laughs> but they made absolutely no attempt to talk to the Open Source Initiative, to the Free Software Foundation Europe, to Open Forum Europe, to uh, Appel, to any of the fairly well-known European organizations that represent open source developer interests. And so we've appealed to them to please change that behavior and, and, and actually come talk to us if they're going to legislate about something which is in our interest area. If they do come talk to us, we will help them with this particular topic because th there's no point I, so I you know I take your point particularly about you know w w w going following the money and and uh, uh, taking legal action against the place where the money is um, the CRA doesn't do that the CRA implicates people who have no money and the reason it does that is it incorrectly assumes that you can ident that there is an identity between the product on the market and the people who developed it they must you know in proprietary software the people the company that develops the software and the software are pretty much an identity and so if you w want to regulate the software you can you can deal with the people who developed it but in open source there's no necessary connection between the software the the, the company placing on the market and the people who develop the software and the the CRA implicitly places a liability on the people developing the software there's uh, a funny thing there. There's quite a bit of projects out there that actually do not have any custodian or yes. you know, there are abandoned projects that are in use in businesses out there. And that, uh, like, how would you do that? Like, does the liability or the whatever go one step up to the general community or the meta community, or 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 do we just have to fork stuff? We, 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 so that I mentioned earlier, but GitHub is actually developing tools to estimate or, as, or figure out, you know, whether or not there will be issue with such uh, repositories or yeah. dependencies or art, or art, artifacts uh, <laughs> already. In, in the, in the connects quite well with this, but yeah, basically <laughs> you're running into a situation where yeah, that legacy well, it's not legacy code, very important code. Yeah, no, it's in use and earning yeah, money. Yeah, can end up causing security issues down the line, and then there might be no actual fix other than forking at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're, ve we're very hopeful that we'll be able to, uh, through the amendment process in the Parliament, lead to individuals not resulting in, uh, not re re receiving a liability for code simply because it's been placed on the market by another party. Uh, and if we can reach that position, I'm not, again, I'm not, I'm not too worried. Yeah. I think that is actually where we're going to get to. We, we, we are in the situation where this product legislation, each state's powers needs to, ha so they need to have these powers. So it's written in this way, does not mean it will be done in the most extreme way possible. But I agree that if you read the sweeps part, for example, of the CRA, it's quite extreme. Yep. And that's the usual bit with, with product legislation. They get the powers, but they won't necessarily use them. Uh, and, and compared to GDPR, which wasn't product legislation, GDPR is special, it's in another category entirely. From other product legislation, we know that they are quite lenient and even often very flexible when it comes to not hunting down yeah. It sounds like some kind of a sword of Damocles just hanging over well, your head. So, and so you so don't know if it's going to drop or not. You know, this is the other problem, is that open source developers typically don't have access to counsel. Yeah. And open source developers are, typically have very literal minds. And they believe that licenses compile. And uh, as a consequence, if they perceive a legal risk, they believe that it definitely applies to them and will harm them. And that is the biggest threat to open source, I think, is people seeing the CRA, seeing the degree of uncertainty around it, and deciding that that is scary enough to make them withdraw. Yeah. Uh, I think that is actually going to be the biggest impact yeah, that that's we have. Just, uh, so I don't want to have anything. I don't want to have anything to do with like this. So this sounds very scary. Away, like you know, I'm not going to do my, my SSL library anymore. Uh, then we'll have European open source, and we'll have the global open source, maybe a Chinese open source over there. Who knows? <laughs> Any more questions? We have one more question on there. And uh, I will bring you back to democracy and uh, EU Parliament. Thank you. Uh, and the reason for that, this is a EU Parliament. It seems to me that it's going to end up in the EU Parliament. Some some people there, 600, 700, going to vote, isn't it? 
So last time this happened, and it was really crucial regarding software, was in the beginning of the 2000 regarding software patents. 2005. Exactly. Being they got the T-shirt. And I, I remember back then I was talking to EU bureaucrats because we were invited by EU, no, UD, which is the uh, foreign agency or the foreign ministry in Norway as a representative for Norway presenting free and open source software for the bureaucrats. And we really warned them about software patents in that meeting. And the EU bureaucrats was totally certain that this legislation will be passed through with just a rubber stamp. And we had lost, and they told us so. And uh, strangely, they only got 14 votes out of almost seven. It was even better than that, actually. What, what happened was on the day of the vote, the, uh, the, part, the parties decided to withdraw the bill. Exactly. Uh, and, exactly. Uh, and the reason that happened, if you're interested, was because uh, the, um, the Software Patent Directive did not create um, uh, protections for interoperability. And because there were no protections for interoperability, which had been included in the Copyright Directive, the, uh, the Conservative group within the Parliament decided the bill was not ready for decision and decided to withdraw it on the day of the vote. Uh, and that happened as a result of very selective, very targeted lobbying, if you're interested. And here it comes, the question. Is it because of this kind of bureaucratic certainty and they only ask people that are in line with their benefit of having an easy day on their job, talking only to organizations that are put there to talk to them. We have the same in Norway. They don't listen to the general public. We have the same in Ukraine, supporting Ukraine with foreign aid. It's a, a civil organization who does 85% of that. And here it comes. Then they disregard the help people actually need that are the ones that are crucially those who are hurt about this legislation. Is it any possible to persuade some heads about here in uh, the parliament? Um, well, I, 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 I wouldn't want to talk about that. So there is a group of people from the open source community who are now meeting every Tuesday to work out what to do about the CRA. We've been meeting for, for about two months and we have submitted m many uh, amendments to, first of all, to the Commission and now to the Parliament. Uh, and we have, we're, we have discussions with um, uh, some of the groups involved in the Parliament. Um, we're not completely confident at the moment that things are going to go in the right direction. To pull off the uh, pressing the red button um, tactic, we haven't yet found a cause that would make someone press the red button on this legislation. Now, with the Software Patent Directive, I was aware that it didn't have an interoperability provision for about nine months before the, it came to the vote. And I was visiting uh, people in the Commission to help them understand the problem. Okay. For this bill, I, we've not identified any issue which is big enough to override the MEP's populist concern with consumer protection. And I feel it is very <laughs> unlikely that anyone is going to decide to press the red button on the wall. Could still happen, and we could still find the reason to do that very late in the day. Having said that, I think it would be quite bad to do that, because I actually quite want this, a good Cyber Resilience Act. Uh, I think that it's very important for consumer protection to make sure that people who sell uh, devices that can uh, provide access to your home. To ev I mean, w what we're talking here is about protecting consumers from home digital home invasions. And uh, I think that we want the legislation that makes it a legal requirement for people to take care of you and not let people invade your home digitally. I just don't want it to kill open source in the process. And, uh, and, and I'm very hopeful that there are sufficient people involved in the process that understand the collateral damage that could be caused by um, giving by extending liability down the supply chain, treating the supply chain as if it was a proprietary company and letting the liability flow down. That would be a terrible mistake, and people understand that now, I think. Uh, there would be a terrible problem if they fail to understand that platforms that distribute software are not manufacturers. 
uh, because at the moment in the CRA there is an implication that, for example, SourceForge or GitHub are manufacturers of the software that they convey. And it would be a very bad mistake indeed for the CRA to do that. So there is language being inserted that, hope, hopefully being inserted, that fixes those problems. If the Parliament fixes those issues, and if the changes I see happening with the Product Liability Directive reduce the negative consequences for those who fail to meet their, um, their duties <coughs> in a way that is not negligent, and if the supporting legislation in the AI Act and the um, the uh, Digital Market Act and the uh, what else is there? Well, there's also a NIST two directive. There's NIST two. Well, but NIST two is in the in the in the process of being. Um, oh, yeah, that already is. Yeah. Yeah, it was all, so NIST two went onto the books in Parliament last year. Yeah, in September. Fact, yeah. In fact, in the 2021, I think it went on. Oh yeah, the, the earlier version. Yeah. yeah. So so NIST two is too late. And the place where we can have an effect there is in each country by country, yeah. making sure it doesn't do too much harm. But About that, by the way, um, now that some of those laws have to be implemented locally, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm expecting there might be some uh, um, public hearings or something in that effect. Who knows? I'm hoping. Uh, uh, is there anything in those of us who care about these topics locally in our na national le um, legislations um, uh, that we should think about when we start uh, interacting the, the local implementations uh, that would help that to make at least to uh, ro roll off the worst or mm. bad effects? Well, well so, so when it comes to directives, sadly, I don't know how do, how do directives end up being implemented in the EEA? So it, 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 as I said earlier, hinted it. You know, it is the 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 best the, the best Latin clash. You know, like they yeah. do the, they you do the best usually in terms of uh, ideally and loyally implementing all EU legislation proper. Like you, when when Denmark Sweden looks, we look towards Norway in terms of what to do it, how to do it right, because you do it to a to a T. Yeah, Norway has influence. That's unlike clear. Switzerland, where they always try their best to not do whatever and go to court over it endlessly. They're so annoying, Switzerland. Um, no, no. So, 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 so basically, it's it's one to one the same, and it, it's in the same way of of, of 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 people wanting to sell on the market in a CRA sense. Yes, you're from Brazil. Oh, you want to sell that here? Good. Then you, essentially, you have to obey EU law in that context. So that's the Brussels effect. It will hit you whether or not whether you want to or not. But in a free and open source, yeah, context uh, from developer side, you know on a worldwide basis, then yeah, we, we want to acknowledge and prevent, but again, we can't right now in the wording, but maybe interpretation-wise, if we don't get into the wording, we can prevent it injuring the community. Are there specific questions we should ask? Uh, right. Well, I, so I, I, I couldn't tell you now, okay. but, but what I would suggest is that uh, we, we do have a reasonable group of people who have been getting deep into uh, all, all the legislation, and when the time comes and, and you see the, uh, the Product Liability Directive update coming into um, the Oslo to be implemented, um, come and ask. Uh, so the, the group that's been reviewing the CRA all the way through, the, all the way along the process, yep. will have very strong opinions about what needs watering down and what needs strengthening yeah. and what needs modifying. And there will be a group of people who will be able to advise you. Say, come and ask me, come and ask the folks at Open Forum Europe or at uh, uh, Appel, um, which is the European Open, the European Open Source and Free Software Group, uh, Free Software Foundation Europe also has a very, uh, um, a very has effective policy. Has it been policy published uh, much on this, uh, like as no. guidelines or anything? Like not really. No. Okay. M mostly, we've been frantically trying to keep up with the stream of legislation. Right. Um, the thing about publishing things is you have to be much more confident about the truth about what you said when you publish it yeah. than you than when you're distributing notes amongst all the people who are frantically trying to keep up with everything. Right. So we have lots of notes, but nothing that I would feel confident putting on a website without legal review. And as I don't have a lawyer, it won't be happening. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, any more questions? Uh, I see a hand up uh, back there. Please hold. Holding for a uh, microphone. Yeah. So, uh, Tom Fredrik Blenning. I'm, uh, I'm a board member of ISAC and the uh, executive director of Electronic Frontier Norway. Um, so, I'm not going to pretend this to uh, even be a question uh, <laughs> because it's more Maybe of a short then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So uh, I know for a fact, uh, so uh, the EU very much sees themselves as a lawgiver uh, also to the EEA, even though we don't have uh, MEPs from Norway. So there's, there are open consultations that we can participate in. Um, I've re read the Kaspers uh, consultation on CSR, uh, but there's also people from Norway, like Lee Bygrave, uh, for instance, from the Institute of Law here in Oslo, who uh, are actively participating. I've been, uh, myself, I've been uh, called as an expert before the EU parliament. Uh, it very much depends on uh, the type of legislation. Uh, sometimes there is actually a lack of experts, so they are very much in need. They want to have you contributing. Other times it's very, very political, and you're gonna try. They're gonna try to shut you out. So it depends. But what I would like to say is uh, there are processes. There are opportunities to uh, influence the EU, even uh, even if you're from Norway, and we should start to actually take the EU uh, law process seriously, because uh, since we implemented the EEA, we implemented about 15,000 acts from the EU as part of Norwegian law. Currently, we are at about 75% of all Norwegian law comes from the EU. So being uh, vigilant about these things happening, there are opportunities and we should use them. And sorry about the lack of question. No, thank you for your contribution. <laughs> uh, should open source communities uh, start caring about EU law? Totally. Totally. But the, the EU has noticed that open source exists. Be very afraid. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that means uh, g g hiring some legal. Uh, in the no, no, you just, or you just join FSF Europe uh, and OSI. Right. Um, if, so, if you're an open source uh, organization, you can join OSI. It's free of charge. You become an OSI affiliate, and um, OSI will represent you or coordinate with you, depending on whether you want to be actively involved or, or intellectually involved. Yeah. Um, uh, Free Software Foundation Europe will do a very similar thing for you. Uh, if you uh, want to spend more money, uh, Open Forum Europe will let you become a member, but they take a fee. Um, Appel, you could become a member at Appel, they've been taking an interest as well. So I, I think open source communities should definitely take an, an interest in EU affairs because... Even if they're US based and said, oh no, those Europeans, they are going, you, you know, the open, they're just making a mess. Uh, uh, one of the mistakes the, the European Union makes is they believe that software can, be, can have national boundaries applied across it. And it would be a foolish to believe the same. Uh, open source software is created by um, by global citizens who can be anywhere uh, and uh, just as everybody benefits from the global nature of open source so open source has to understand that it, it, it can be affected by global affairs um, you can decide that you are going to be you know working from your mother's basement in Nebraska as is the uh, the, the XKCD meme um, uh, but even there, you will probably be wanting to design your software so that it complies with the law as it's emerging in various countries. Um, and we mustn't forget that China has worked out that regulation is an effective barrier to trade as well and uh, is consequently engaging in WIPO-approved uh, patent and regulatory activities that mean that you should pay attention to what China is doing uh, because um, they can also affect the way that you're the architecture of your, pro if the architecture of your project is one library, you probably don't have to care. If you're designing um, the, if you're designing Perl and uh, CPAN, you should probably be paying attention. To are there the any are. good news sources on these <laughs> topics, by the way, that you would recommend? Uh, uh, an RSS yeah. feed. Yeah. So the good part about the cybersecurity and computer science part angle of this is that most of the papers are open source, so you could read them regardless of your affiliation or work. Uh, but don't try to read the, the, the law papers, they're often behind pay yeah. paywalls. And on the other hand, this is the EU, so anything you want to read from them, transparent and easy to yeah. access, luckily. So so, f so you can subscribe to alerts from the European Union on these topics, and yeah. you'll find you get quite a lot of them. 
Um, everything is translated into every European language. Um, so, so, so you can, so, so, so you can, so you'll be able to get it in Danish yeah. or Swedish. Um, and uh, uh, it can be a little bit inscrutable, but it's actually remarkably readable once you've got used to it. Yeah. Um, as a news source, there is a, a news channel called Euractive, and Euractive has excellent coverage of, uh, of EU technology law issues. And it's actually worth read, the, reading their uh, materials. I would follow the policy hashtag on Mastodon uh, because that's what everyone tags all their policy-related things with. If you follow hash open source and hash policy on Mastodon, you'll get everything that I write about it, for example. That's awesome. um, so I'd be following those things. Uh, but it's you, you know read the laws. Then they're, they're they're actually written. They're all written in uh, English for the for the uh, person with English as a second language. No more legalese. Uh, there, there is legalese in there because just every topic has um, has technical terminology. But once you become familiar with the structure, so as as um, as we as Casper was saying earlier, they all come with a set of uh, of um, uh, explanation at the top, which tends to be called recitals. They all come with a set of uh, things that have legal effect called articles and they all come with a set of variable parts or longer reading that are called annexes and uh, once you're used to that structure you you can find out pretty much what the law says just by reading the recitals you typically don't need to read the articles because the articles are typically quite they're quite they're quite they're very precise they're quite complex structures whereas the recitals say in very clear terms what this bill is supposed to do and so you can just read the recitals and pretty quickly understand what the law does. Right. Brilliant. I think uh, we've run out of time, and it's awesome to uh, end on a note uh, that is actionable and can help us get better informed. Uh, and I would say thank you to the three of you to, uh, that came here and uh, inform informed us on such short notice. Uh, and uh, thank you to everybody who watched the stream mm -hmm. or came here to uh, to join us with questions and uh, and an open mind about uh, what's going on. Uh, we're going to say th thank you to everybody now and uh, say this was it all. And uh, as uh, if I put on my ISOC hat again, um, uh, Internet Society is a membership organization that cares about policy and stuff around the internet in Norway. That's the Norwegian chapter that does that. But we're also a global organization that cares about how the internet is used and it, it continues to be a, a force for good around the globe. So I, I urge you to join. Uh, the, uh, and if you are in Norway, we also have a, little, a policy channel where we discuss issues like these now and then and coordinate if there's some, uh, some public consultations, for example, that we can might reply to. Or, uh, and uh, in, any, in any case, I hope you to see uh, some of you or all of you uh, at uh, meet meetings in the future. And um, we're a tiny community and a tiny country. And those of us who are here, we care about uh, policy issues, I think. And I, I hope you came here because of that. So please uh, know that uh, there are more like you. And we're trying to gather each other so we can um, make this more uh, a viable community that tries to improve the situation, not only for ourselves in Norway, but also have public uh, conversations for things that are relevant for S the Swedes and the Danish that listen to Norwegians, apparently, <laughs> and anyone else. Uh, so um, thank you for coming. I uh, urge you to join our organization. And uh, um, that's about it. A uh, hand for our uh, panel, please. <laughs>